Motion Blur, a very useful tool for a cinematographer to tell their story. Today, we're going to take a closer look at what motion blur actually is and how it affects video. We're going to look for a way to measure motion blur and discuss some of the best practices, you know, some of the perfect settings for motion blur. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So first of all, what is motion blur? How does it affect a video? Instead of explaining this in words, take a look at several examples. As you can see, the same action actually sort of feels different depending on the amount of motion blur in the video. As you can see, too much motion blur creates a very dreamy effect. The video appears very smooth. In fact, so smooth it feels unnatural. Whereas the version with too little motion blur feels jarring and choppy. So understanding the effect of motion blur as a concept isn't too difficult. But how do we measure this? If you're a filmmaker, how do you express this idea? Turns out it isn't exactly straightforward. Now, if you're a photographer, you'll be saying, well, that's not difficult. Why don't we just look at the shutter speed? And in a way, that is true. While the shutter speed, which determines the length of exposure of each individual frame, does tell us something about motion blur, it doesn't paint a complete picture. Consider this example. Let's say we want to shoot a ball moving from left to right. We'll do so with two different sets of settings, the first of which being a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second with a frame rate of 60 frames per second. Let's try to trace the motion of the ball and observe the motion blur captured. At the very beginning, let's start time at 0 seconds. Let's place the initial position of the ball here. Now, let's jump forward by 1 60th of a second. The shutter speed tells us that this is how long the exposure will be. As a result, a simulation of the captured motion blur is shown above. Because of the frame rate, this time interval is also the time interval between subsequent frames, meaning that the next frame begins at the 1 60th of a second mark. Moving forward, the next exposure is 1 60th of a second again, so we capture a motion trail not unlike the first. If we were to repeat this thought process several times, and we combine all the motion trails that were captured on screen, we get something that looks like this. A continuous blur that tracks the entire movement of the ball. Now, let's try this again, but this time, we shoot at a lower frame rate. 30 frames per second. Of course, we keep the shutter speed unchanged, at 1 60th of a second. For the first 1 60th of a second time interval, everything is as you would expect. A motion trail is created. However, things are very different for the next interval. Because of the reduced frame rate, the next shot hasn't begun just yet. In fact, for the second interval of time, the camera is idle. Only on the third interval, that is at the 2 60th of a second mark, does the second exposure actually begin, creating another motion trail. Repeating this thought process moving forward creates a very different pattern of motion trails compared to before. In fact, only half the motion is being captured. So yeah, this should serve as some kind of a counterexample to show us that shutter speed alone is actually not enough to describe the nature of the motion blur. Well, at least in video. Instead, in a context of video, a good measure of motion blur should take frame rates into account as well. This is where shutter angle actually comes into the picture. Now, it might be a little bit strange why are we measuring the amount of blur as an angle, it turns out that this notation actually has its roots in history. You see, back in the day when people shot movies on film, basically what they had was a mechanical shutter. They needed this because, well, you had to advance the film along, and you couldn't just do it while it was still being exposed, otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be capturing anything meaningful. So they introduced a shutter, which is essentially a circle with a notch cut into it. While the notch is in front of the film, that means that the film is being exposed. Then, once the shutter rotates to where the film is actually occluded, 
that is the chance for us to advance to the next square of film, and wait for the notch to come around again. So we can sort of piece together why the size of the notch matters, the wider the notch, the longer the film will actually be exposed. Despite that, the size of the notch actually doesn't say anything about the absolute shutter speed, because we don't know how often the shutter actually rotates. How often does a shutter actually rotate? Now, we know that for a complete revolution, basically you have an exposure time as well as time for one square of film to advance. So therefore, if we were to have one full rotation, that should correspond to exposure of one frame. So in fact, the rate in which the shutter spins is just the frame rate of the film. In other words, shutter angle is the unit we need because it expresses exposure time relative to frame rate. In fact, the greater the shutter angle, the more blur you're gonna get. In fact, if you take the ratio between the shutter angle and that of a full circle, so 360 degrees, that actually tells you how much motion blur you're going to get relative to the movement. As you can see from the diagram on screen, 180 degree shutter angle basically throws away half the motion, which makes sense because that degree is half that of a circle. So this understanding allows us to move forward. Is there a good shutter angle for shooting video? Turns out there is. In fact, the general rule of thumb is 180 degree shutter angle. As far as I can ascertain, this is just out of habit. It seems that many movies actually do use 180 degree shutter angle for the majority of their shots, so that is what people are the most used to. Clearly, you can and should change it up if you need to. But what we are more interested in today is what if you cannot follow this rule for some reason? One example of this would be, well, recently I was out, I was shooting in very bright daylight, and in order to get a decent exposure, I had to bring everything down. So I was shooting with ridiculously high shutter speeds, completely breaking the rule of thumb when it comes to shutter angle. I did not have a choice because I didn't have an ND filter. Of course, when you're shooting in very bright conditions, ideally you would have an ND filter, and those basically act as sunglasses for your camera, so that, you know, you can choose the settings you need to choose as opposed to choosing very high settings out of necessity. I was trying to explore to see if there is any way in which I can actually work around this problem. And as it turns out, I have found a not too bad solution. The solution was to shoot at a higher frame rate. Then in editing, use frame blending to get the frame rate back down to the desired amount. As you can see, the effect is possible. When motion is small, the blending of frames creates what appears very similar to motion blur. This doesn't work quite as well when the motion is large, since you can more clearly see the crisp outlines of the two images layered on top of each other, which ruins the effect. Of course, there is another drawback of this workaround. In order to accommodate shooting at a higher frame rate, your camera may have to reduce the resolution of the shot. My camera can only shoot 60 frames per second at 720p. So that's another trade-off you have to consider here. So yeah, there you go. Basically, this has been a very long video really leading up to me talking about an experiment I've done. Today we've taken a look at motion blur, we have tried to understand what it is, as well as how to measure it. Then we moved on to look at the perfect motion blur, so to speak, and that is a 180 degree shutter angle. I also described a little hack in which I worked around that rule not to very great results, but passable ones. So yeah, we have a lot to work with today. In fact, the easiest way to learn more on this topic is to experiment. Take a camera, go and just shoot video, and try to shoot it at different shutter speeds. Using your frame rate and the shutter speed you've chosen, try and figure out what shutter angle you're shooting at, and basically see for yourself how the video behaves, given a particular shutter angle. That is basically all there is for this episode. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on photography and image editing subjects.
If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.